evening. I think I know quite a few people in the audience, but for the benefit of our external guests, I'm Tara Dean. I'm the provost for the university, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this inaugural lecture by Professor Jeff Cox. Now, inaugural lectures are very special, very special for the individual because it marks a pinnacle point in their career where they can share with colleagues, you know, external collaborators, their achievement to date, what they're going to be doing in future. And I was here earlier, and I see it's more than just slides with written words in them. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. And it's also for our schools very important because it's an opportunity for the schools where our professors are based to showcase with the staff and students the range of activities which happens within the schools at London South Bank. And of course, for the university as a whole, it's equally important because it's an opportunity for us to share with the wider network, the general public, our contribution in terms of research and teaching and the expertise that we have within the university. So we re record all our inaugural lectures and they will be available in a few weeks um, for viewing. If you really enjoyed these lectures, I certainly try and look at the ones that I haven't attended in person. So they would be made publicly available as well. We now hold these meetings in person, and having them in person is really good. Not only you will be able to interact with the professors, but after the event, there is also an opportunity to meet, network with other colleagues, collaborators. I know we have people here in the audience who joined us from other universities in London as well. And because of that, because it's a face-to-face -face meeting, bear with me when I go through some housekeeping. So we're not expecting any fire alarms, uh, testing. So if they, you hear the sound, you need to exit. Where is the, huh. This is when you discover you need a fire exit sign in the rooms. I assume it is there. And in an orderly fashion and find your way um, to the fire assembly point. Can I also ask you please to turn off your mobiles, make sure they are on uh, silence because it interferes with the recording as well. So allow me to introduce Prof. Jeff Cox. <coughs> it was a difficult one, Jeff. I'll tell you why in a minute, because Jeff, firstly, let's get all the official lines. He is a professor of art and computational culture at London South Bank and is also the co-director of one of our research centers for the study of networked image. And he also co-directs our MA in curating art and public programs in collaboration with the Whitechapel Gallery. Jeff obtained his PhD back in 2006 <coughs> from University of Plymouth and the title of his thesis was Anfit Thesis, The Dialectic of Software Art. Very interesting topic. In fact, you have a website called anfitthesis.net. You should go and visit it. I did. And I don't know if many of you were around at the time of what I refer to as dot matrix printer. You know how things were presented? The whole of the website reminded me of my own PhD thesis printed in one of those machines. Quite an interesting website. Graduating from Plymouth University with his doctorate also means that at each graduation, we have the pleasure of seeing Jeff in a bright orange <laughs> doctoral gown of University of Plymouth. I think I commented on it when I last saw you at the, 
Yes, I, I don't like the color, I must say, <laughs> for graduation gown. So prior to joining us, he did, in fact, after his PhD, work at Plymouth. And he's also worked at Aarhus University in Denmark. In fact, alongside his current role at LSBU, he has two other visiting professorships. One is in Denmark, in Aarhus, and the other one is in University of Zurich. Jeff's research interests lie broadly across the field of software studies and contemporary <coughs> art aesthetic, expressed in occasional artwork, invited talks, and numerous publications. Published books, including Speaking Code, Coding as Aesthetic and Political Expression, with Alex McLean, Aesthetic Programming, a Handbook of Software Studies with Winnie Soon, who is in the audience. Aesthetic multi-authored book project, Live Coding, a user's manual with um, Alan Blackwell, Emma Copper, <coughs> Thor Magnuson, and Alex McLean, published by MIT Press last year. He co-runs a yearly workshop, publication, yearly workshop which leads to a publication in collaboration with Transmediali Festival in Berlin, and he's been doing that since 2012, and is co-editor editor of the Associated Open Access Online Journal, as well as editor of the Open Access Data Browser Book Series. Most recently, his work include Ways of Machine Seeing, explored in a special issue of the Journal of AI and Society for Spring and Nature, co-edited with Mitra Azar and Leonardo Impet. And the public engagement project, I was really pleased to see this, for 2022, funded by the Turing Institute, in this connection, he's actually an advisor for AI in society and culture, an, an initiative of Oxford University Press. Jeff has been building creative collaborative networks for many years, traveling constantly between European centers, so much so that one of his colleagues in the university now thinks of Jeff as a network itself. <laughs> I thought that was quite good. Jeff is really one of the most prominent advocates for open access publishing. And he brings that <coughs> ethos to his colleagues and students. I kept naming various <coughs> collaborators he's published with. He involves them in different international initiatives and ensures that their work is peer-reviewed and published. I ask few of his colleagues, how would they describe Jeff? This is what they said. He's a strong and positive figure in any gathering, but his unassuming and quiet nature often leads him to momentarily forget his own presence. Like the electrical and data system he studies, Jeff is a current, an energy of a man and a constant motion. They said really lovely things. I've just picked a few things that they shared with me. And these are the people who have worked for a long time with Jeff, so know him probably in professional capacity very well. His colleagues said that Jeff is someone who will always find time to see you, no matter how busy he is. He's also always organizing a post-event gathering to continue the conversation in a more relaxed setting. But I just want to say the networking afterwards is organized by the university and not by Jeff himself. <laughs> and he is a gentle person in his demeanor but rigorous in his advice and criticism, a rare gift. His service and citizenship to his discipline and to LSBU and beyond 
is recognized through many activities. And I'm just going to pick on one. He has supervised 16 PhD students to completion and is currently supervising five PhD students. He's been external examiners for many PhD students in City University, Hong Kong, Dundee, Goldsmith, Helsinki, King's College, Kingston, Middlesex, Bournemouth, Huddersfield, Manchester, Northumbria, University of Arts, London, and Dublin. This just demonstrates how well embedded and recognized he is within his discipline. I'm really delighted that you have chosen LSBU as your academic home and look forward to listening to your inaugural lecture. Before inviting you to deliver this lecture, I leave everybody with one sentence from one of his close colleagues. The image I have of Jeff is of a man who deeply respects the world and travels across it lightly. Please join me in welcoming Professor Cox to deliver his inaugural lecture. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tara, and thank you all for coming this evening. I hope my, my talk will be of interest. Um, I think this is where I say thanks to many people, and it's quite difficult to set the limits. I'm going to be really general mm -hmm. and just say, you know, thank you to my colleagues in the research center, CSNI, in the school, and to many of my friends and collaborators that have come this evening. From There's someone here from the Photographer's Gallery. There are people from Whitechapel Gallery, for instance, some of the key institutions that we collaborate with. Um, I was even going to thank workers of the world, but maybe that's a bit old-fashioned. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, following in this, what I gather is a tradition of showing photos of yourself. I don't have photos of myself at LSBU, but I did find this old GIF animation, which is of me as a child dressed in West Ham United football kit and also dressed in my sister's party dress. <laughs> and then there's a, obviously there's a script alongside this that, that you know, offers a kind of caption to this image. And I thought this fitted quite well with the subject of last week's lecture as well about gender equality and also sets the scene for thinking about binary logic and binary forms and kind of like trying to undermine some of this, the, these kind of paradigms. It also indicates, although you might think it's a bit rubbishy, but it sort of indicates something of my background. You know, I, I went to art school. I mean, really, at heart, I'm an artist who kind of does other stuff these days, but with an artistic sensibility. And also, I think at the heart of my work is an attempt to defer authorship as much as possible to work in collaboration with other individuals and other institutions and, of course, other machines and to try to think about notions of originality, authorship, provenance and representation, of course, and such like, you know, important issues. Then I'm going to go through a few slides that give a bit of background before I go into more detail about the subject of the talk. But here we go back to 2001, which begins my journey into thinking about software culture. And there's a collaborative essay on the left uh, written in 2000 and, yeah, 2001, which was trying to get to grips with the significance of working with program code and thinking about it in terms of not just what happened when it executed, but what it kind of represented in its own right as a script. And the argument here is that to argue for an aesthetics of generative code, one has to both look at the script and what that script does in the world. Similarly, out of that, I co-curated an exhibition called Generator, which had some funding from Arts Council England and toured to three venues. And this tried to bring together 
artists working in a conceptual tradition with an emerging group of people who identified as artist programmers. And this was a scene I was really interested in, but I was interested in trying to understand it in terms of the way that artists, conceptual artists in particular, have worked with instructions. So we had works by Sola Witt, Yoko Ono, Stuart Brisley, because also the interest was in performativity, and then younger artist programmers, such as the ones I wrote the text with. Then I thought I'd just show some other projects which tend to be book works, but they're not academic books, they're artist books. And this is a project which was exhibited as part of the Generator show. And what, um, what we did was we put a terminal, computer terminal, in a cage at Paynton Zoo and a group of Sulawesi crested macaques were given the opportunity to type letters. And this was a kind of, kind of joke on the familiar idea that if you have an infinite number of monkeys over a, an infinite amount of time with an infinite number of typewriters, eventually they produce the complete works of Shakespeare. <laughs> it got some attention, this, in the show. It was also picked up by the press. I'll show you some clippings in a minute. But it also was f featured in Documenta 13, which is one of the most prestigious contemporary art exhibitions that happens every five years in Kassel. And it was part of a, a, a small display called The Worldly House, which was inspired by the writings of Donna Haraway, her writing about multi-species co-evolution in particular. And the book is now part of the Documenta collection, which I still consider to be a fantastic achievement for Elmo, Gum, Heather, Holly, Mistletoe, and Rowan. <laughs> of course, in keeping with what I said before, I'm not mentioned, which is a really important part of the project, I think. And you can see a close-up of the text here that was produced. Keys tend to, tended to get stuck because of the kind of goo that was um, accumulating on the keyboard. But you can see a kind of flourish at the, at the end of the, of the book, which is quite pleasing. And this got picked up by the press, as I said. It got picked up by a press agency. So it went kind of wildly across the world. It was on the BBC, it was in Australian, Canadian press. Here you can see from left to right, you know, clockwise, I should say, top left, the um, Times, and then there's the Daily Mail, and then it's the Sun, <laughs> and, and then the Guardian. You can recognize the type font of the Guardian. This got picked up and interpreted in all sorts of different ways. Obviously by the Sun in terms of what a waste of Arts Council money but it also was picked up by new scientists and other people kind of interested in the, you know, the kind of experimentation and the ideas of generativity that it was trying to, to promote. And then another example, this is still background really. I, I thought I would show another book that I'm really proud of, which is a kind of artist book. It's part, it's um, my role as part of a self, what I would call a self institution called the Museum of Ordure. And we, we basically are interested in what is valued by culture and what is not given value. You know, so in other words, you know, the kind of rubbish of culture, the waste of culture, even the ordure of, of culture. If, you, if you're familiar with the word, of course, it means kind of broadly would be translated as shit. Um, one of the members of the Museum of Ordure is in fact the performance artist Stuart Brisley who's had a whole career of working with shit. So the book, it's probably not very clear there, but it's, um, it's our collection of communist manifestos. And on the cover is the complete text of the manifesto, you know, through, running through the book jacket. It's nicely bound with a red thread. 
nice sort of object. And then on the inside are about 100 different covers of the Communist Manifesto at, from different points in history and, of course, from different cultures and in different languages. And then, finally, as part of my preamble, this is the PhD that Tara mentioned. Um, it was published as a book later by Aarhus University Press. And if you look carefully, you can see the text starts with a small script, a Perl script, and it ends with a script as well and no full stop, which means it can be copied and run in the command line and it actually executes. So this was important for the, for the thesis because the idea was that texts operate in the world, they're operative, they're executable, they, do, they, they perform actions. Um, this is one, you know, this is one expression, I suppose, of that tradition of artistic research, of practice-based PhDs. It was 60,000 words, but it was also an epistemological object in itself. Okay, so that's my, I mean, that's really the preamble, and then I'm going to go on to the subject of the talk of the evening, as you know, it's entitled, What Does Software Know? This is actually the abstract rendered with um, a visualization, some visualization software called GraphViz. Um, I'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a second, perhaps. But I should just say that the talk is broadly structured in four parts. First, I'll explain what I mean by software studies. Then I'll introduce three books. Again, Tara has mentioned these books. These books I've either written or co-written, and they expand on this line of thinking, and also my commitment to certain kinds of ideas. And then I'll end with an example of another project which relates to machine vision and the funding from the Turing Institute, which was also mentioned. So in overall terms, what I hope to demonstrate is the need to look beyond, beyond the acquisition of technical know-how alone to knowledge practices more commonly associated with art and culture. Diagrams, like the one you can see, serve as a good example of these tendencies, both helping to explain and visualize complex ideas, as you get, of course, with information graphics and flowcharts, but and a means to scramble knowledge that is pre-given to allow for the unknown to emerge and to suggest further lines of inquiry. So this, if, if you like, you could see this as, an, as a mixture of information studies and continental philosophy. So I say this about diagrams, but I'm saying something similar about software as well. So not software as a means to disseminate knowledge, but also as an, as an epistemological object in itself. An object that can lead to insights beyond the capacity of the human sensorium. Software studies, to explain, is a cross-disciplinary research field which studies software and its social and cultural effects. Software as a distinct object of study, not limited to computer science or software engineering, but also using cultural, theoretical, and practice-oriented approaches from the arts and humanities, a way to engage and communicate knowledge of software as a cultural form. The current series editors of the Software Studies book series at MIT Press pose the following questions to help explain its scope. You've probably already read it, but I'll read it anyway. How do we see, think, consume, and make software? How does software from algorithmic procedures and machine learning models to free and open source software programs shape our everyday lives, cultures, societies, and identities? How can we critically and creatively analyze something that seems so ubiquitous and general, 
yet is also so specific and technical? How do artists, designers, coders, scholars, hackers, and activists create new spaces to engage computational culture, enriching our understanding of software as a cultural form? I'm putting it more simply in this talk. I'm asking, what does software do? What does it know? And what does it want? And these three questions set a rough structure of the talk and loosely correspond to the three books that you can see on screen. And as I said, the last part, I'll talk about another book, but one I haven't written. So the three books, I mean, the, the dates are there, and as you can see, they're co-authored. The first one is published by MIT as part of the Software Studies series, and the last one, published in 2022, is also part of the Software Studies series at MIT. And the middle one is uh, co-authored with Winnie Soon, who's sitting in the audience, and this was published by Open Humanities Press. So, first book. The book Speaking Code begins by invoking the Hello World convention used by programmers when learning a new language. Such combinations of natural and artificial languages that you can see on screen demonstrate a multilingual human machine confusion of tongues under the conditions of contemporary semio-capitalism to the point where it seems we no longer understand one another's speech, echoing the Tower of Babel. In the book, published in 2012, remember, my example was social media. I was particularly thinking about Twitter. But per per perhaps a contemporary example would be large language models like ChatGPT. If we ask ChatGPT about the myth of the Tower of Babel, it replies, according to the myth, the people of the world spoke a single language and decided to build a tower to reach the heavens. However, God was displeased with their arrogance and decided to confuse their language, causing them to speak different tongues and halting their construction. As a result, the people were scattered across the world and could no longer communicate effectively with each other." End quote. So if we agree that machines can speak broadly, then under what conditions and, under beha on, and, and on behalf of whom? Like other speech acts, programming oscillates between process and expression. This further resonates in the ways code opens up broader discussions around the production of knowledge. For it's clear that there are myriad ways of saying hello in a multiplicity of human and machine languages, and a great complexity in the ways that human humans and computers interpret them. What you are seeing on screen is a looping of more than 100 Hello World programs written in different programming languages alongside a diverse selection of human languages, combining them into a real-time, multilingual, machine-driven confusion of tongues. This analogy to speech, or more specifically to speech act theory, neatly demonstrates how we do things with words and how we do things with code. Here I'm referring to the work of J.L. Austin, of course, the, the book, How to Do Things with Words. Of course, and as you are probably thinking, computers don't literally speak, but follow prescribed rules of execution, tasks, and actions. Nevertheless, there is more to coding than formal logic, and the purpose of the book Speaking Code was to explore these performative and political dimensions. Obviously, in the background to this is the, you know, is the way that when we talk about free software, there's this analogy to free speech. Oops. You know the, the kind of saying, free software as in free speech, not as in free beer. 
But of course, you know, with the book also argues that your free speech is a kind of fantasy anyway. We became really interested in these kind of performative dimensions, even thinking about the way that code had this poetic quality. You know, you could you could write it and it could be executed a bit like poetry, you know, which can you can read on a page or you can speak. So I thought I'd remind you of that earlier piece of program code that we saw on screen. If open brackets, variable identifier boy, close brackets, open curly brackets, close curly brackets, else, open curly brackets, return variable identifier girl, semicolon, close curly brackets. Okay, this leads me to the second book, co-written with Winnie Soon, as I mentioned. In aesthetic programming, the pedagogic and political implications of software studies are further developed. Remember, this is 2020. The book, which is simultaneously a website and Git repository, follows the principle that the growing importance of software requires a new kind of cultural thinking and curriculum that can account for and with which to better understand the politics and aesthetics of algorithmic procedures, data processing, and abstraction. It explores power relations that are relatively under-acknowledged in technical subjects concerning race and class, gender and sexuality. This relates to a politics of representation, but also non-representation how power differentials are implicit in code in terms of binary logic, hierarchies and structures, naming of attributes, and how worldviews are reinforced and perpetuated through computation. To give a really shocking example, we could think about some of the language of programming, like the use of master-slave, um, which indicates these asymmetric Communi um, asymmetric communication between processes or devices. You know, it's quite, it's quite incredible that that was used uncritically within engineering communities. That's not the case anymore, really, but it's still truly shocking that this is even once thought of as acceptable. So in keeping with this kind of problem, we've tried to be, in the book, we try to be sensitive to our received methods based as they are on Western rationality and traditions of knowledge production and notions of progress rooted in European colonialism and extraction practices. We point to the work of the anthropologist Anna Singh in this regard, as it offers a feminist perspective in which indeterminacy is taken more seriously to reflect the precarity of lived conditions. We didn't look to mushrooms for inspiration as she did, but to the indeterminacies and imminent qualities of technology itself. Paying attention to fundamental or key concepts from programming provide new insights on cultural phenomena increasingly bound to computational logic from the inner workings of software and of course its material conditions. The book itself followed a reflexive approach, like many of the previous examples I've cited. It's offered as a computational object open to modification. A printed book, a downloadable PDF, a website, and a Git repository. In the section Open Publishing, we described how writing code and writing about code are forced together in ways that reflect broader cultural and technical shifts in data practices and open publishing initiatives. Moreover, if we consider books to be like software, they are not only there to be read, but acted upon, shared and updated, and rewritten anew. There are many precedents for such an approach, of course. It is probably clear that free and open source principles underscore the thinking, namely, 
an emphasis on software development as a collective practice that challenges the normative social relations of production associated with commercial development, such as narrow definitions of authorship and copyright and fixed divisions of labor. This can clearly be extended to the production of books and the associated reputation economy of academic publishing. And our publisher, I think I mentioned Open Humanities Press, broadly reflects these principles. It's a scholar-led academic publishing group. And I would encourage you know, colleagues to publish with them. It's, um, I think it still scores highly in the ref. And, um, but it's, um, they're a pleasure to work with, and they give you a lot of autonomy over what you can do. There's probably few publishers that would have published this book in this way, I would suggest. Similarly, the designers we worked with on the book, the Open Source Publishing Collective based in Brussels, design using only free and open source software, and all files are freely available using a Git versioning system that contains all the files of the project distributed under copyleft principles. I mean, here you can see all the chapters of the book, so you're able to download them, reversion them, make your own book. So in su summary, because I think this sets out the intentions of the project really well, I'll read the last paragraph of the preface. We would like to stress that this book is not simply the physical object that you might be holding in your hands as you read these words, but a computational and networked object distributed across various other spaces and temporalities. The book expresses itself as a dynamic object, not fixed in terms of attribution or commodity form or specific determination. It follows that although this preface is only the beginning of the book, there can be no end. This book is purposefully stuck in an endless loop of its own becoming. And I can give examples of that in practice. The use of a Git repository for our writing allowed us to formalize the production of the book as an iterative process, allowing for its reversioning and for others to fork a copy and customize with different references, examples, critical reflections, and even new chapters. So this is what happened with the addition of chapter 8.5, talking back contributed by Mark Marino and Sarah Siston, very active in this field of software studies. That added, amongst other things, some more detail on the early chatbot, Eliza. You know, they thought some of our writing was, you know, didn't contain enough detail. So this chapter sits between two chapters and fills in some of those gaps very neatly. We're also currently working on a Chinese translation with a Taiwanese publisher, Zimu, Taipei Digital Art Center, and a local community of artists and developers. As you can imagine, the issues here extend to how cultural translation and forking, forking a new version, combine together in a highly politicized context like Taiwan, you know, where the use of uh, classical Chinese is, um, is obviously in contention. And then I, I just wanted to quickly, I'm still sort of on the second section, but I wanted to just quickly talk about how this, working on this book has led to other initiatives in experimental publishing, some of which are funded by the Collaborative Fund of LSBU. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we've been developing these ideas in the context of the project which was mentioned, the yearly project with Transmediale Festival. And we've developed uh, a, a wiki for the, gen for the production of texts. Here you can just see a fragment. And then using wiki to print tools, you can produce uh, a PDF which will be part of our 
APRJA journal that we run, which is hosted by the Royal Danish Library. So the idea is to, to, to develop a bespoke publishing infrastructure which allows us to draw together some of these separated processes uh, um, in journal and book production where writing, editing, peer review, design, print and distribution can be brought more closely together. All this, of course, this reversioning also takes place in public, which is a very important principle. Similarly, for a book series that I co-edit with Open Humanities Press called Data Browser, this allows us to also produce the manuscripts for the books in this way. So the last published book, which is called Volumetric Regimes from last year, again was developed in a wiki. So you can see in public the development and the editing process and the peer review of the texts, and then eventually a book, you know, could be in your hands. But that material is there, again, to rework if necessary and to refashion in some way. So Tara also mentioned this commitment to open access. I mean, this is a kind of, what I would hope, a kind of radical end of open access in a way. You know, it still seems really surprising to me that in academic publishing, scholars still produce their works for the ref exercise, for instance, in really conventional terms. You know, you write your journal article, you send it off. Some months later, if you're lucky, you get some reviews back. Then you, um, you might do another version. Then you send it back again for approval to the editors. Maybe a year or two later, your article comes out in a journal. This seems really inappropriate, especially for this subject matter, I would say. And we're not alone in this. I mean, even MIT, of course, are experimenting with these kinds of publishing initiatives. OK, book three. I don't know how I'm doing for time, but um, hopefully it's OK. So book three. The recently published multi-authored book, Live Coding. It's another example of knowledge production that undermines any simple separation, I think, of subject and object. So the subject of a book and the book as an object, I think it begins to kind of blur this distinction. <coughs> and although more conventional than the previous examples, it's still open access and can be freely downloaded shared, and if you wish, edited, subject, of course, to a Creative Commons license. For the privilege of open access, we actually paid 15,000 American dollars. So although MIT you know, has gone some way in this direction, there are still some big compromises, I would say, in terms of the implementation. LSBU paid 3,000 towards this, by the way, if you're wondering. So to briefly explain what I mean by live coding, if you're not already familiar with the phrase, it's a dynamic creative practice across cultural and technical fields, ranging from music and the visual arts to computer science. Live coding describes the writing of software in real time changing a program while it's running, writing software as an as a improvisatory and performative practice. So with live coding, neither the programmer nor the program makes finite choices or decisions as such. Rather, each becomes part of an open-ended and contingent process a process of um, ultimately problem solving, I would say. Hello. <laughs> I was going to give an example, but we couldn't get the sound to work. Um, just two weeks ago, I went to the International Conference of Live Coding in Utrecht. And this is what live coding often looks like in practice. 
It's performed in nightclubs, it's usually music based, it, usually people are moving a bit more. It's not, it's not. Um, so this is a bit of a random example, but um, when the documentation is produced of this, we'll, we'll make sure that the, the version is edited with the sound. Okay, um, so perhaps not surprisingly from what I've already said, in writing the book about live coding, we try to register the parallel to writing, you know, to think about writing as live writing, how the process of writing down thoughts were themselves a kind of improvised and collaborative performance. Our method was to draw freely on the affordances of technologies to render ideas in conversation and conversations in a written form that is nevertheless embedded in technical infrastructure using wikis and other collaborative writing platforms, the kinds I've already mentioned. Thus making a reflexive loop between the act of writing and an engagement with the material apparatus through which the writing was rendered. So you can see on screen there is, um, we were, I mean, I was working with a colleague at University of Cambridge and we were writing lots of notes using a wiki and then we got kind of like confused about the sheer mass of material we were <laughs> producing. So we just printed it all out and laid it out on tables and used post-it notes to try and bring order to the, to the work. And then I thought this quote from Karen Barad was also useful in trying to explain what, what's at work in this process. Again, I'll read it out. In an important sense, it is not so much that I have written this book as that it has written me, or rather we have interactively written each other intraactively rather than the usual interactively, since writing is not a unidirectional practice of creation that flows from author to page, but rather the practice of writing is an iterative and mutually constitutive working out and reworking of book and author. Back to the kind of main line of argument I'm trying to make. In the chapter, What Does Live Coding Know? We explored how live coding offers a transdisciplinary challenge to some of the assumptions of what constitutes knowledge. In asking, what does live coding know? The intention is also to expand beyond an anthropocentric understanding of knowledge. Here, what live coding knows is not synonymous with what the live coder knows, but rather refers to the epistemological potential of the practice itself, including the knowledges arising in and through the collaboration between human and machine sense-making. Consequently, we might ask, what forms of knowledge are produced in and through live coding? What does live coding know? Moreover, how can this be shared? What is the epistemological contribution of live coding within a wider interdisciplinary discourse, whether in relation to computer engineering, musical composition, or artistic performance? How might it register uncertainty in this respect, not knowing? along with a desire to know. So this embrace of uncertainty is often conceptualized from the perspective, from the perspective of creative practice or indeed artistic research or practice-based research. But we, but we might also invoke the decision problem that helps to define the limits of computation. The decision problem unsettles certainties about what computers are capable of and what they can and cannot do. This is especially important as decision-making processes become more automated, what Luciana Parisi describes as algorithmic decisionism that tends to privilege quick decisions over correct ones. Here we see the instrumental reasoning of the machine and especially the AI machine take form. And as such, it seems important to also think about how unknowns 
are very much a part of this. In the case of live coding, uncertainty of outcomes are made apparent. All decisions are revealed to be contingent and subject to internal and external forces that render the performance itself undecidable and prone to errors. This contingent aspect has been well established in a history of ideas. Here I'm thinking of the work of Michel Foucault and his archaeology of knowledge. But it's also necessary to conceptualize knowledge that is less human-centered, broadly the position of the post-humanities and all the problems associated with the centrality of man. When I say man, of course, again, the assumption is white Western man. In the book, we refer to the feminist techno-science of Karen Barad, who drawing on quantum physics, demonstrates how apparatuses and subject objects mutually create and define each other, and as such are thoroughly active and productive of and part of phenomena. In other words, the making, doing, and becoming of live coding is materialized through what Barad would call a complex intra-action of elements. Moreover, we know from the uncertainty principle that things are known and unknown at the same time, that there is a trade-off between knowing and, or not knowing. And from the complementarity principle, we know that objects cannot all be observed or measured simultaneously. These are inherent conditions for the way scientific knowledge is produced as part of wider relational networks. As such, Barad challenges the epistemological and ontological inseparability of the apparatus from the objects and the subjects it helps to produce. So as I hope is clear by now, and sorry that this has become a little bit convoluted, my intention is to demonstrate the potential of live coding, and by implication, software in general, to unsettle the knowledge regimes through which it circulates across various domains and networks of practice, arts and performance, computer music, software engineering, computer science, and so on. The book argues this to be the critical potential of live coding and of software practices and maybe the arts in general to question what constitutes knowledge and to recognize the extent to which machines of all kinds including computers and software, are active and constitutive parts of knowledge production. We might further speculate on what it means for machines to know, especially in the context of machine learning, which produces its own distinctive form of know-how as reasoning through and with uncertainty, as people have said. With this in mind, and in this part of the talk, I'd like to shift attention from what software knows to what it wants. And characterizing the discussion in this way, as if software were a living entity with its own desires, is another way to extend the various threads relating to human and non-human agency mentioned up to this point. The anthropomorphism of the machine, in this sense, draws attention to the underlying sense of desire in algorithmic procedures. In the production of prediction, what does machine learning want? Adrian McKenzie argues that predictive techniques demonstrate operational power that generate statements and prompt actions in relation to instances of individual desire. What is desired, it seems, are new forms of control over what and how something becomes known, new forms of power knowledge, if we follow the writing of Foucault. In our recent work um, at CSNI, you know, the Center for the Study of the Networked Image that was mentioned at the beginning, we've been trying to understand some of these instances of power knowledge in terms of literacy a literacy that extends beyond reading and writing to automated forms 
such as generative AI. By literacy, I hope it's clear, I mean not only the ability to write and read, but more broadly, the competence or knowledge of practices that allow users to maintain and build social imaginaries. Literacy is a combination of skills, a material system, and a social practice, and constantly changing and being transformed by the development of inscription technologies. And if we broadly agree that there's a moral imperative to encourage everyone to learn to read and write, then an expanded literacy, the ability to read, write, and program, helps to understand what signs and symbols mean and do in their operation. In another book in the Software Studies series, Annette V makes a compelling case for coding literacy, but also raises concerns about the motivations around the kinds of literacy that are being introduced and who's introducing these literacies. This should clearly not be the preserve of computer science, nor an elite group of specialist programmers or black boxed by the interests of big tech. I hope it's already clear that the book Aesthetic Programming was an attempt at an intervention in this direction. But to what extent does the notion of literacy still apply? And to what extent does media or computational literacy or AI literacy remain up to the task of analyzing contemporary culture? At the same time, the relation between what is made visible and the names or annotations that we give to what we see, or indeed what is visualized from a text input or a prompt, seem to persist as a problem of literacy rooted in the tendency to conflate representations with the things that they represent. What are we to make of large pre-trained vision language models such as DALI, Crayon, Stable Diffusion, Mid-Journey, and the like that set up complex relations between words and images? Part of the challenge when it comes to machine learning is that the code logic is different as the learning does not just rely on symbolic logic, but statistical logic too. So what kinds of literacy are required? When it comes to generative AI, it would seem that we need a literacy, knowledge or skills, but also social imaginaries, that extends beyond representational modes and human sense-making, and is attentive to the relation, relational operations of algorithms, data sets, and infrastructures. Coming towards the end, in the last part of the talk, I refer to another book, not written by me, but by John Berger, the Marxist art historian John Berger. Ways of Seeing was a TV documentary made for the BBC in 1972, the scripts of which were adapted into a book of the same name, published by Penguin, also in 1972. Again, it CS and I, we've been working with this reference for some time now, initially with colleagues at the University of Cambridge, the Cambridge Digital Humanities Group, and also colleagues in the Computer Lab. In brief, Ways of Seeing emphasized how particular elite forms of knowledge were legitimated to support class, gender, and racial privilege. Our interest is how, and to what extent, these issues map onto discussions and critical AI around bias and decoloniality. Berger's essay highlights the underlying conditions that allow us to see how visuality is constructed and by extension, how knowledge of the world is produced and how it's consolidated into worldviews. So in the example here, we can see the training set as the algorithm's worldview, a very limited one in this case, as you can see. Seeing is an effective way in which power differentials are legitimi legitimized, and yet, as Berger points out, 
the relation between what we see and what we know is never settled. I could easily end this talk on this point, but thought it useful to briefly demonstrate how we are working with these ideas in practice. Learning experiments in visual literacy and computer vision is a current project developed in collaboration with the Institute of Education and the Photographer's Gallery. And as was mentioned, it's supported by the Alan Turing Institute. We've been working with secondary school teachers and teacher training students to ask how computer vision impacts upon visual literacy in schools. Our leading questions have been, how are machines taught to see? How has visual literacy been transformed by developments in computer vision? And how might this feed into education practices? Might we rethink creativity in light of AI? And rather than worry about whether AI is creative, think about how creativity itself might be thought of as algorithmic. And what has changed? What is the changed relation between what we see and what we know? So we've been running a series of workshops um, derived partly from a collaborative PhD of Nicolas Maleve, who studied between here and the Photographer's Gallery. You know, we, we like to promote this model of collaborative PhDs here at LSBU. Initial ideas were used to collaboratively brainstorm possibilities and applications for classroom activities and lesson plans. Numerous questions emerge from our discussions, not least this parallel understanding of learning and training both in pedagogy and within computer science. So we asked, you know, what might one field learn from the other in terms of its understanding of learning and training? The problem we address is the urgent need to update our methods of teaching and learning about machine vision in institutes of education. And that goes for schools, but also, of course, for higher education. The prevalent view is that the only relevant skills our advanced knowledge of mathematics and programming. Again, we ask, what might art contribute? What is understood by visual literacy and what is its scope? What are the cross-curricular or interdisciplinary opportunities? We don't offer answers, but a framework for further inquiry and action. So we're building a toolkit in the form of a wiki, um, similar to some of the examples I showed as an iterative teaching resource that brings together our, our activities and ideas in development by the broader collaboration. In the longer term, we see this project as a step towards a change in the curriculum and to argue for the importance of visual literacy and the contribution of the arts. Beyond the orthodoxy of STEM, challenging perceptions about the necessary skills and methods needed for data science and AI. Finally, I should say, if it's not already clear by now, that to ask what software knows is to assert in this context that a technology such as AI or ChatGPT is not merely a tool, but is epistemological. What it knows remains in question. And there I end my talk. Thank you very much for listening.